And to dig a little deeper, joining us now is Ken Belkin, constitutional and civil rights attorney. So, Ken, Students for Fair Admission, that's the group that brought the case against the president and fellows of Harvard College, saying the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause was violated. Uh, what more do we know about this group? See, what we know about this group is, one, it is a majority Asian student group. And what has happened here, or what they have alleged has happened, and what the Supreme Court has affirmed has happened, is that the, these students that were applying affirmative action practices were in place that allowed race to be considered. Now, this had a noble purpose, to ensure diversity amongst the student population. But at some point, point that changed and what began as a noble purpose to you know encourage diversity amongst the student body has actually led to the discrimination of Asian American students and the denial of their admissions to at least these two universities and we can presume probably other universities that use similar race-based admissions criteria. So I found this very interesting. In his majority opinion, Chief Justice Roberts left the door open for people to talk about race in their personal essays, noting that nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. So it sounds like he isn't fully stopping the consideration of race as a factor for admission. Is that how you interpret that statement? Yes, but he doesn't want it to be a tipping point. Look, let's be clear. Someone growing up in this in, in, in an area of the country that might have a lot of racism still active, maybe where there are active chapters of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, and not to stereotype, but someone maybe growing up in, in, in a racially segregated southern area might have a very different experience as a black teenager as someone who grows up in New York City. And race in that context made it presented unique unique individual challenges to that person. But I think what Justice Roberts is saying is that race in that of itself should not be used as the basis of someone's character or the basis of any challenges they might have overcome. So Justice Sotomayor's dissent has slammed this ruling, saying it undoes decades of progress into racial equality. So what is an admissions office to do now? What are the challenges they're presented with after this ruling, Ken? Well, they really can't make race be something that is a tipping point and something that is used to discriminate against another minority, which would be, in this case, Asian Americans, which is seems to be what is happening throughout the country. And locally, we see it happening in New York City with our, our five public specialized high schools. You're seeing that Asian Americans are being denied. There's this you know, feeling that maybe there's too many Asian Americans and we need to limit it. But the reality is this is America. And if you are able to excel in America and achieve the grades and on your merit, you should be admitted to these universities. The fact that you're Asian should not be a basis of denial of admission. So do you think this may ultimately, down the line, make it more difficult for employers to considering hiring on race as well? Look, I, I think we're, we're going to face a challenge. Back in the day, a lot of these institutions had to be forced through affirmative action mechanisms to ensure that there was some diversity in the workplace or in the university. And I think some people think that we have come a long way and that we should be striving to achieve that colorblind society. But we're never going to know if we've achieved it if we don't test ourselves. And now might be a good time to test it, at least on the university level. And might I add that testing it is in compliance with the Constitution. We have the 14th Amendment. It was enacted in the wake of the Civil War. And it prescribes that there should be no discrimination based on race in law. And we need to live up to that. And I know America has not always been the best at living up to it. But I think we need to challenge ourselves to do better. And I view this ruling as a step in in that direction. So Ken, uh, does this provide insight into how SCOTUS may rule in other big cases like student loan forgiveness and discrimination against the LGBTQ community by businesses? 
I, I don't think you can read too deeply into that. And I, I'm one of these legal analysts and attorneys that rejects the notion that you can divide the Supreme Court up amongst conservatives and liberals because you really can't. Because historically, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg considered one of the most liberal justices and Scalia considered one of the most conservative justices. They often agreed on issues such as Fourth Amendment protections against search and seizure. There isn't a liberal or a conservative slant there is a constitution and there are those justices that seek to interpret it one way and other justices seek to interpret it another way. But I reject the conservative liberal binary. All right, Ken Belkin, thank you for that insight and for joining us. Thank you for watching. Go to newsnationnow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.